So uh, in um, 1 Kings, we hear about Samuel asking for wisdom above all other things. Um, when Samuel was king, that was the height of Israel as a political power in the ancient uh, Middle East or Near East. And after that, and we will start to see some of the story of Solomon's reign and what happens after his reign, how things go to pot. The, the unified people of God split into two separate countries, so to speak, two separate groups of tribes. The Northern Kingdom gets overrun and uh, then the Southern Kingdom, Jerusalem in Jeremiah's day is overrun and the people are taken into exile in Babylon. And that's what we read about in Lamentations. So just so you understand more fully the context of Lamentations. And you might get confused by some of the poetic techniques that Jeremiah or the author of Lamentations is using. The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. But hear all you peoples and see my suffering. My young women and my young men have gone into captivity. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. Well, it sounds as if he's talking about himself. The Lord is in the right for I have rebelled against his word. See my suffering. My young women and my young men have gone into captivity. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. He's using the poetic technique. He's identifying himself as Jerusalem, as Judah, the people in the Southern Kingdom, the people of God. And he's calling to his lovers, meaning the people of God have, in a sense, committed adultery against God by not being loyal to him. And this probably, calling to my lovers, refers to asking for help from Egypt and some of the other nations that uh, were outside of God's people that in other times had persecuted them, but that they call for in their distress during these times. So take into consideration that Lamentations is a poem. And remember, one of the things I think we saw briefly yesterday in the little description that I pulled up on screen was that most of these are um, acrostics, I believe is how you say it. In other words, each line of the poem would start with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's arranged artificially. It's arranged in a way that it's expressing through a kind of artificial language, the suffering of the people of God. Now flash forward to the time of the apostles and the acts of the apostles. Jesus is preparing to ascend. And what happens? Well, I'll tell you because we're gonna go to it because it's right here, see? Look at that. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Their question for Jesus after his three years of ministry, his passion, death, his resurrection, his 40 days, walking, eating, talking to them. They know he's about to ascend to heaven. That's what he's told them. Or at least they're anticipating something big. He's called them out to the mountain where he's about to rise. And the only thing they can think of is, okay, now you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Now we're going to be the way we were during King Solomon's time a thousand years prior. Now we're going to have the political power and might that we so much deserve. We're no longer going to be captive in Babylon. We're no longer going to have the Greeks having um, invaded us and having um, controlled us as an occupying force, which happened a few centuries before Christ. We're no longer going to have the Romans who are still here occupying us and bullying us around. No, now we're going to be strong on earth. But what does Jesus answer? Does he say no or yes? He says something really different because Jesus never answers the way we expect. He answers, he tells us what we need to know, not so much what we want to know. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Oh yeah, you wanna talk about power, he's saying? Sit tight. 
you'll have power. It will be the power of my Holy Spirit dwelling in you, which we have. Do we feel powerful? No, St. Paul says, when, where I am weak, there I am strong. This focus in America in particular on political victory at the expense of everything else, where Christians are abandoning all sense of truth, where they commit themselves to a lie, all sense of um, leaders with dignity and leaders who are in fact Christian. There are Christians who still admire Vladimir Putin, who is doing everything he can to destroy the innocent people in Ukraine. And there are people who think that that sort of political victory from a man who claims to be a Christian is more important than looking at what's actually going on in his, in his heart or in what he's doing. Don't be fooled. We're not Christians because it means we're going to win. We're Christians because it means we're going to lose. And the great sign of our loss and our defeat is the cross. That's not a sign of victory. That's a sign of defeat. Now, there's a deeper victory that comes with it. Resurrection, the gift of the Holy Spirit. There is a kingdom that Christ comes to bring but it's not the political kingdoms. It's not the city of man. It's not the earthly city. It's not the petty power over one another that we seek, which he comes to give. It is a far deeper power, the presence of God within us. At any rate, that's what I have to say about today's readings. More tomorrow.